Um, as you know, last year when we postponed this event, um, we expected to all be together now um, in, in person. And unfortunately that's not possible. Um, but fortunately, this way of doing things has allowed us to widen the participation in the event. And um, all of this has actually helped us to get much better at a more inclusive way of doing these kinds of events. And that's one of many, many ways that we are changing how we do work within the academy, outside the academy and between um, the academy and, and our partners in other sectors. Um, so today's panel, I'm absolutely thrilled that we have today so many people who have been so fundamental, not only to Q plus at Cambridge, but to rebuilding Cambridge in very fundamental ways around race, gender, sexuality, and really a different idea of how education can be organized, how knowledge can be uh, shared and created and how we can work together to use the academy as a transformative space. Um, so um, I'm also really grateful to the panelists today for um, agreeing so um, helpfully to be online again <laughs> and, um, and to do this as a Zoom event, which is also being live streamed and recorded. So we'll have presentations from all of the panelists. There'll then be time for Q&A. If you wanna ask a question, you can raise your hand using the Zoom function and we'll try and accommodate as many questions as possible. Um, and you can also put questions in the chat and we'll try and incorporate those as well. Um, this event is being recorded and there will be a recording available afterwards. And I would encourage you also to make sure you visit the Q Plus website to sign up for uh, the, the two remaining panels for, for this conference running from four to 5.30 tomorrow and following day tomorrow, um, organized by Hakan Sandal Wilson on queer methods and on Thursday by Jeff McGuire on queer temporality. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our panel chair, um, to Waithira Sabatandira, who has been a key part of Q Plus since its inception. And um, thank you once again, all of you panelists for joining us today. It's very, very exciting to have you all here. So over to you, Waithira. Thank you for that intro, Sarah. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, like Sarah mentioned, um, I'm Waidara. I'm I used to study law um, at undergrad at Tit Hall, um, and I did my MPhil and gender studies there as well. Um, and I was also um, the student union women's officer for a little bit. Um, and in my time there, um, I just got really interested in a lot of the organizing that was going on, a lot of the organizing that persists, and a lot of the ways in which people have moved. Uh, forward with what they've learned once they've left Cambridge. So yeah, I'm really excited to be chairing this as part of the Queer Times Conference and generally to be part of the Q Plus program because I think it's doing such essential work um, in the field of queer studies in the UK. Um, and I think we can acknowledge that this work couldn't be done without you know, the funding and support of the university and simultaneously sit with the fact that this work is produced within an institution so steeped in violence, both historical and ongoing. So it seemed really fitting to include a panel like this um, in the conference. Uh, and when its title was first suggested, I was reminded of my time as women's officer. Um, specifically, I was one of a number of women's officers involved in the sort of drafting and promulgation of the university sexual misconduct policy. Um, and that involvement prompted several feelings from me, none of which were contradictory, all of which were sort of equally valid to use that Tumblr-esque language. Um, and I preemptively ca caveat this by saying that all of these observations came from that specific time and, and hopefully things have changed since then. But, uh, you know, I was glad that, um, you know, we were finally getting a framework through which survivors could potentially access some form of accountability uh, from perpetrators of harm where that hadn't existed before. Uh, I was glad that money went into fundraising a counsellor specifically trained to support survivors where previously one hadn't existed at all. Um, I was sad though that the bar was on the floor, basically the bar was in hell, <laughs> um, thinking about how the the chances of a student actually attaining accountability 
within a reasonable time period uh, or even at all. Uh, it was still extremely slim under this policy. It was frustrating that certain colleges put up such a fight um, in terms of implementing that policy themselves and that there seemed to be no real way of holding them accountable if they failed to properly implement the policy. Um, I was angry that at no stage did the university hold itself accountable for ignoring demands from the women's campaign for years that the problem of sexual misconduct on campus be addressed. Uh, and I was disgusted by the possibility of this policy being used as a means of making Cambridge stand out as a progressive you know, institution to prospective students at a point in time when the news was replete with reports of an epidemic of sexual violence on university campuses. Um, just disgusted at the idea that the work of survivors and that survivors themselves could be used by the institution as a means of accumulating profit, you know, in the context of an HE sector increasingly consumed by neoliberal logic. So while at what's now Cambridge SU, but what was then Kusu, with all those feelings, um, I tried to focus on how I could use the university back, you know, how to engage with the university such that I could steal away enough from it, enough resources, enough time and give it directly to survivors and everyone else who had experienced gendered violence while working and studying at Cambridge. Um, I don't actually think I did a very good job of that, nor do I think I was thinking expansively enough. But when the title for this panel was first suggested, uh, I decided I wanted to hear from people who in their own contexts have done a good job of this, are doing a good job of this, continue to do that work um, of putting universities to queer unintended use of perverting the rules of institutions in which they're employed in order to make space for their political demands, of queering institutions with the intention of abolishing them because we, um, and we being a broad collective of people bent under the wheel of capital and those who stand with them, you know, we no longer have use for those institutions. Um, so I've not made any real effort to interpret the word institution itself, although maybe that's something that the panelists will want to do as this hour, hour and a half progresses. I'm just interested in what's currently being done and wanted to have a public chat about it, which brings us to our panelists. So first, and this isn't necessarily the order that you have to speak or whatever. First we have Siang. <laughs> uh, Siang uh, Wei is the Postgraduate Access Education Participation Officer at Cambridge SU for the 2021 academic year. In this role, they organize and advocate for the interests of postgraduate students at Cambridge with a particular focus on access to and experiences of postgrad education. They previously completed an MPhil in political and economic sociology at Cambridge, where their research examined the role of anti-communism and Sinophobia in contemporary British Chinese identity projects. Then we have Lola Olufemi, who is a black feminist writer and Cream Stuart Hall Foundation researcher from London. Her work focuses on the uses of the feminist imagination and its relationship to cultural production, political demands and futurity. She's the author of Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, and also of Experiments in Imagining Otherwise, which is forthcoming from Hijar Press this year. And he's also a member of Bare Minimum, an interdisciplinary anti-work arts collective. Uh, Christine Pungong is also a member of Bare Minimum. And additionally, she's an artist, researcher, and curator interested in psychogeography, spatial practice, black feminism, and queerness. And she currently works in community arts programming. And finally, we have Abira Khan, who is a researcher and educator based in London. She's currently a PhD candidate at SOAS, the Center for Gender Studies, funded through the SOAS Research Studentship. Through a combination of discourse analysis, ethnography, and archival research, her research interrogates the category of queer Muslim as it is de deployed in London. Abira teaches on empire, race, and queer and feminist studies as a graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Sociology at the LSE and the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. So I'm going to ask them all now to talk for a few minutes about their initial thoughts um, read the idea of queering institutions, thinking very broadly. Um, please feel free to sort of submit questions throughout rather than having a set time um, at the end for q and I think I prefer something a little more organic. Um, that said, if a speaker wants to sit a little while with your question before answering, um, I think we can come back to it. Also, if it gets a bit chaotic, um, I reserve the right to just do the Q&A at the end, like no more. <laughs> okay, with that, let's start with Abira. Thank you, Adira. Um, can you share the PowerPoint? Thank you. Sorry, I'm technologically illiterate. One second. Okay, can you see that? Perfect, thank you. 
Um, so in this uh, brief amount of time that I have, I want to reflect on the possibilities that emerge in thinking through these quotes together in relation to teaching. So I want to think about the queer uses of pedagogy in an attempt to trouble the political and intellectual stultification I have experienced over the course of my doctoral studies. So rather than lay my investments in the existence of the university as we know it, I want to think about what educators can do while we wait for its annihilation. So I wish to linger on the role of pedagogy within this landscape of stultification, the visions it articulates, the limits and potentials of these visions, and the tools at the disposal of those of us willing to enact them. So I personally can't deny the role the academy has played in the development of my political consciousness by way of pedagogy and community. So to paraphrase Moten and Harney in the quote that you see on screen, it is teaching that brought me in. Yet, as my role within the institution shifted from undergraduate student to graduate student worker, I have had to reckon with the limits of the university's potential as an emancipatory site. Is this stultification, particularly the potential for pedagogy to affect this even through its most well-meaning iterations and the pains that can be taken to avoid its effects that concerns me? So the classroom oriented towards the subjects of gender, race, and empire may hold an appeal for those students hoping to address, possibly even redress, through knowledge, the violent exclusions that structure their realities. Their critical pedagogue is sympathetic to these desires, probably relates to them, but is also vigilant to how the university is still a colonial site made possible by and through violent exclusion. So the classroom is a site uh, where coloniality and racial capitalism haunt in the sense proposed by Avery Gar Gordon, the very constitution of the classroom, the institution that builds it, the students and educators that enter it, the marketized educational system that enables it. It is here that I'm wary of the potential for pedagogy to reinforce what Eve Sedgwick has called the hermeneutics of suspicion by continuously enforcing a criticality that vests its interest in the repetitive exposure of the ubiquity of violence. So what use is this redundancy to those students who enter the classroom aware of the myriad ways they are, always, they are already under subjection by the subjects of study? So my own experience as a student teacher has just demonstrated that when it comes to the study of gender, race, and empire, it is more likely the students are honing their capacity to more accurately name and analyze that which they already know. So the current disorder of things lays bare the lived and felt legacies of coloniality and racial capitalism. So amidst this, it feels not simply insufficient, but perhaps even irresponsible to impart a scholarly critique that hinges on the obvious sentiment that things are bad and getting worse to students who are intimately experiencing our collective worsening conditions. So I want to ask, what is to be done until we patiently await the abolition of the modern neoliberal university as we know it? So Gordon elaborates that haunting in her words refers to this socio-political psychological state when something else or something different from before feels like it must be done and prompts a something to be done. As much an intellectual as a personal project, Gordon speculates on a path that is not simply invested in diagnoses of and bearing witness to suffering, but an invest investment in doing something towards its end. Utopic as these aspirations may be, they may propel our pedagogic and political projects to demand more, imagine anew, and offer no concessions in the process. So here I want to think seriously about the methods that we use in our teaching as a site of doing this something. I think it is essential that we dwell on the affects and effects that undergird our pedagogic practice and habits. Here, I found it helpful to think through Jose Esteban Munoz's hope as a critical methodology and Eve Sedgwick's expansion of Melanie Klein's object relations theory, particularly her reflections on the uses of paranoid and rep reparative positions in queer thought. So according to Sedgwick, the paranoid position speculations assume that the efficacy of knowledge lies in its ability to expose violence. It therefore always assumes a suspicious stance aiming to unearth and subsequently expose the oppression embedded within, around, and by the objects of study. The dilemma that is left uninvestigated by the paranoid position is that it assumes, in Sedgwick's words, 
that quote, to make something visible as a problem were, if not a mere hop, skip and jump away from getting it solved. Elise felt that evidently a step in that direction, end quote. So as refutable as the paranoid stance of adage that things are, batting, things are bad and getting worse may be, it is sometimes worth the risk of disappointment to dwell even further on the possibilities of the something to be done. So the reparative position understands it. So in contrast, the reparative position understands the inevitability of violence. So rather than continue the cycle of critical cynicism, it risks the potentially fracturing and traumatic experience of hope for the possibility of ex extracting sustenance from the objects of study. So it mourns the formerly idealized view of its object, but through this mourning manages to accept the object in its entirety. So this isn't a reformist project, but rather a critical stance that attempts to imagine the future otherwise, precisely because of the damning conditions of the present. These two positions are not mutually exclusive, nor are they sequential, nor are they competing. Instead, what Sedgwick is concerned with is the monopolistic hold of the paranoid position on criticality, especially on queer thought. So neither Sedgwick nor the queer feminist debates that have followed her um, uh, have followed her reflections on the paranoid and reparative positions have taken seriously the potential of queer feminist pedagogy to embody these stances and what the impact of this embodiment could be. Um, so Robin Wiegman and Claire Hemmings have reflected on how the queer feminist embrace of the reparative can be a way for the queer feminist academic to affirm her own stance within the university to comfort herself or themselves that her project of the mastery of knowledge, her investment in the utility of critical interpretation is ultimately a worthy political project. So understandable as these criticisms may be, I find these terms necessary but not sufficient in addressing the political project that is teaching. I want to end with a quick reflection on Gail Lewis's defense of the reparative, its ability to foster connection, moment by slippery, uncertain moment connection. So Lewis counters that Wiegman's conceptualization of the reparative stance dismisses the pursuit of possibility of nurturing connection. For Lewis, reparation's merit lies in its capacity to surpass the very narcissistic modes of knowledge production that constitute the regimes of individualized, neoliberal, racist, homophobic, classist, colonial power that create the conditions for the ghostly aspects of social life. For Lewis, the reparative stance reminds us of knowledge's potential for fostering a connection that underlies our collective dependency. So Gail Lewis imbues the reparative as a possible methodology of hope that may help us endure the inundation of violence in the here and now, so as to make conceivable in Munoz's words, a then and there. This emphasis on relationality and interrelatedness as a mode of criticality, as a credible strategy for approaching our knowledge objects, is what can aid a utopic orientation to Sedgwick's original question. What does knowledge do? So one can argue that the connection emphasized by Lewis and the relation, relationality called for by Munoz in his work make it emphatically clear that there is something to be done. As such, I argue that the reparative stance endorsed by Lewis and Munoz is, in Munoz's own words, spawned of a critical investment in utopia, which is nothing like naive, but instead profoundly resistant to the stultifying temporal logic of a broken down present. So the site of the classroom, saturated as it is with historical ongoing violence, can turn into a site of pragmatic utopias, utopianism through a backward glance that, rather than being satisfied with exposure in the present, may dare to enact a future vision. So the university, as I have discussed previously, is as perfect a site as any to exemplify our broken down present. The institution where I am currently undertaking my doctoral studies has in the immediate past undergone multiple phases of cuts through the guise of bureaucratic restructuring, exists within a national university system that is required to adhere to repressive counter extremism measures. Um, in, in addition to a national hostile environment, which further institutionalizes border violence within the university and is in the midst of a massive national wave of casualization of higher education labor, all of which compound the vulnerabilities of those already on the margins of the university. So higher education is without a doubt an industry haunted by unresolved social violence. 
What has sustained me through my differentiated but relational experience of this dysfunctional system is precisely the moment by slippery uncertain moment connection that develops disbands and develops again. It has taken form through friendships, partnerships and mentorships that were made possible in the hallways and classrooms of the institution. It materializes through collective mobilization in the form of demands to our departments, strikes, criticisms of the exclusionary mobilization of trade unions, and strategic organizing to visibilize violence inside and outside the institution, all in the hopes that something may be done towards alleviating, if not abolishing harm, and doing it with each other. Thank you so much, Ibira. That was, I think, as beautiful as it was illuminating. Um, okay, next up we have Sian. Hello. Um, I'm going to go from slightly shorter, maybe a bit less beautiful. Um, I have been, I've spent the past, you know, almost a year mostly talking to uh, university committees. So, <laughs> um, a slightly different register. Um, but so, yeah, I am currently um, an officer at the Students' Union. Um, I think one thing I can say about being in an institution and attempting to change it is that um, there are many days that I wish that I was a student because there's a lot of freedom that, that comes with kind of being able to do what you want um, that is lost when you get close to a center of power or you think that you're close to a center of power. Um, and there are things that you want to do with it. Um, but I think something that I have learned through this experience is uh, there are obviously different kinds of institutions, institutions that you can try and grasp things from and change and institutions that uh, fundamentally will uh, grind you down. And uh, the university is one of those. Um, but also what comes with kind of seeing inside the institution is a feeling of your of being in a privileged position, but then also um, seeing into seeing the details of a, of a place that seems very powerful, but also seeing all of the things that mean that it must eventually be abolished or abolish, or abolish itself because it simply doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work for the people who are in it, as I'm sure we all know <laughs> and have experienced, but it also simply doesn't work um, by its own logics, by its own rationalities. It doesn't work as a business model. It doesn't work as a sustainable place. It doesn't work as an institution with policies and processes that are able to maintain maintain the functions that it you know says that it has or that it needs to have or that it values itself for none of those things work um and it's quite depressing <laughs> um because you see all of all these things happening and to you and i think to most people who have not been inside the, that institution for as long as a lot of people have um, or have you know less riding on pretending that everything's fine um it seems very obvious that the things that you're saying are true or the things that you think are true um but there's a lot of effort that goes into collectively ignoring um problems because individuals who uh, are in certain positions also don't necessarily have the power or believe that they have the power to change anything um i think one of the things that i have learned is that as a student and as someone who is in the student union of course I care about um, students experience I care about um, the university I care about well I care about the university in some way um, and a lot of your work is centered on the university and I think when when it comes to thinking about you know creating the institution or abolishing the university it there is a tendency or a, um, a push to kind of focus on the institution itself and what you're going to do to it, how you're going to confront it and how you're going to kind of act upon it in order to in order to change things. And I actually think what I have learned, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> is that is to, I guess, decenter the, uni the university or the academy as the site of its own abolition. That is not where it's coming from. And I think while, you know, obviously my role is to represent students, to, <laughs> to advocate for them, to improve access, to improve their education. And those things are important for people to, for the people who are here, who have that experience to, you know, 
feel like they can continue to have, you know, bearable experiences to, you know, make people have no case time um, in a place that is quite horrible um, in many ways. Um, it's also, I think, very important to, I guess, think, at least I think of my role as something that what the thing that I can do or take from the university or like use the institution or my position in it to do is to organize people to build power in people in a specific place people in the place that they are students are students and people who work to work with staff at the university as people who work in a specific location but also that its purpose is part of a wider movement as purpose is to kind of you know train people up train people up <laughs> train people up in ways that they are not trained in 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 the teaching of their course so to speak um to develop people's understandings of where they are what their position is as you're a student if you're a student why are you experiencing things that are horrible why is it why does it feel impossible that you can achieve justice why does it feel like there's nothing you can do about it because there are all of these you know because of capitalism <laughs> because of marketization because of like neoliberalism and for those understandings the skills that people develop for the kind of relationship building power building organizing for those things to be to build as much power in this place that we are in as much as possible but then also obviously the university especially when it comes to students is a very transient place a place where people kind of go for a few years and it feels like it's your whole, whole life and then you usually will go on to a different place myself accepted i've been here for so long um you'll usually move on um and for those understandings for those things those are things that you can not necessarily steal from the institution but use the space that it creates the space within it to develop to build to build like those kinds of capacities that work with those that are outside the institution as well because you know abolishing abolishing cambridge it would be nice um and it will be nice it will be nice when it happens um but it's not happening because of the students union <laughs> it's not happening because of student organizing itself it's happening because of wider changes that fundamentally kind of break down the logics um to which the university itself is bound or feels that it's bound and which you know you can't change it except through structural material. Let's say revolution. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're sort of uh, been rambling for a bit. That, that was really great. Great to end on revolution. <laughs> um, Christine, did you want to jump in? Hi. Um, sorry, it's a bit like the sun is in my face. Um, so. Um, I spent a lot of time um, since my time at university working for various art institutions. Um, I've worked for like private galleries and sort of public institutions. Um, and now I'm sort of working in community programming. Um, and so kind of when I was reflecting um, on this panel, I kind of thought to focus a bit more on um, the kind of the relationship that I have with um, arts institutions and particularly museums and their sort of extremely fraught um, pasts. Um, so the Public Art Museum is a part of um, the complex institutional dynamic that links um, the political state and the nation. The rise of the Public Museum as we know it now, which I guess was sort of cemented in the 18th century onwards um, is inexplicably linked to the formation and emergence of nation, nation states. Um, museums were and still are used as a means of defining national identity and propelling political ideologies that serve the collective good of the state. Um, museums work uh, specifically by attempting to absorb into cultural memory a prescribed set of values and ideals through the displays of objects of national heritage um, with the aim of encouraging communal pride and identification and ownership of these objects. So by, well, I guess what I'm saying is that 
by their very nature, the vocabulary of a museum is one of violence and is not one that I feel can be reconciled um, or reformed. Um, and I personally believe that attempts to reform or decolonize museums are completely futile. Um, while I do believe in museums as social institutions that should be accessible to all, calls for museums to be sort of representative of, you know, the diversity of cultures or values in any given uh, public or society are pointless because there's a conceptual slippage between what museums say their actual aims are, so education, community building, the preservation of heritage and legacy, and the political, the actual political reality embodied within the models, uh, the modes of their functionality, which is to homogenize and act as instruments um, of the state and of hegemony and disciplinary power and panopticism. A la Foucault. Um, museums should be understood as an institution that, um, that was designed to not only promote nationalism and colonialism, um, but to physically, also to physically encourage citizens to regulate and police themselves in public space. Um, so how can we reconcile this history of violence governmentality and control with queerness or how um, I guess can we use this to our ends um, like I said I don't think it is possible to actually reform museums um, as the principles on which museums are built will never meaningfully allow that change and attempting to conform to their principles is um, it's not going to give us anything, um, it's not going to be revolutionary or give us anything that we actually want. Instead, um, the goal should be about creating new spaces and structures for marginalized entities to have their own agency outside of national collections um, and public museums. Um, I guess queering, the idea of queering museums doesn't really make sense to me specifically, I guess, because to be queer is to oppose any form of institutionalized politics in the first place. And it should be a radical rejection um, and disruption of the things that museums uh, necessitate and represent. Um, I mentioned briefly sort of the, the history of museums and the connection to the formation of nation states. But, you know, even if you think about the going even further back, the basis of museums as we know them now, um, with cabinets of curiosity in the 16th, 17th centuries, and the muse museological impulse to classify, taxonomize, and catalog. Um, to me, queerness uh, is in opposition to all of these things, um, and especially Black queerness resists representation and assimilation, embraces anti essentialism and anarchism. And the two sort of ideologies, I guess, um, can't coexist. Um, so I want to think about ways that artists can make and create an archive that escapes the institution of the museum and or seeks to abolish it altogether. Um, I guess uh, the, the sort of three spaces that I'm going to briefly talk about um, that are the most like prime for these kind of experiments um, and interventions are the internet, the body, and I guess the street or the public. Um, so I'm starting with the internet because I wrote my undergraduate dissertation on how black internet artists use the situationist principles of derive and detonement to navigate the psychogeography of cyberspace. Um, so I guess I have a lot of thoughts about the internet um, and its ability or it's the possibilities within it to create work that rejects the superiority of the physical gallery or museum space. I think it's interesting to think about what freedoms can be found um, for Black queerness and Black queer artists in digital publics and what new media and the internet can offer Black artists in resisting hegemony and oppression that exists both in the physical and digital 
or virtual realms. Um, there are a lot of really amazing queer artists working digitally outside of institutions. Um, I guess I want to note as well as the, the sort of limits and problems of the internet. Um, and, you know, I reject the idea that the internet is this sort of radical utopian, like raceless space where people are free from the material confines of their own bodies. And, you know, I acknowledge the insidiousness of digital surveillance technologies um, and the way that they target um, marginalized people, including, you know, queer and black people. But I do think that, um, the internet does offer many possibilities. The speed and the fluidity and the temporality of the internet can mean that the dissemination of black queer cultural production is immediate and incredibly quick. And the connectivity of the internet allows for community building, solidarity and resource sharing in a ways that might, more not be, might not be uh, possible in the physical realm. Um, I think it's interesting to think about the difficult relationship that exists between and the representational problems that exist between um, blackness, queerness, and technology. Um, I, I want to quote uh, Rizvana Bradley here, um, who is a art historian and sort of new media scholar. Um, and she talks about uh, the representational problems of visualizing blackness through a technological lens has to do with the slippage between the black body and the abstract framing of blackness as epidermalized. As a result, blackness cannot signify within the regimes of our pre-existing technologies and breaks with and transgresses many of the codes that establish technological representation. Um, I like this in particular because I think there are a lot of freedoms um, that exist within this sort of notion of blackness and queerness as well to be resistant to representation and um, an inherent refusal to be replicated or commodified. Um, and I think this freedom um, offers um, a lot of possibilities and I, it's particularly like, um, I think it's particularly useful in that it cannot be easily co-opted by institutions for their own political means. And I think they offer great possibilities um, for artistic creation that doesn't have to be assimilated. Um, I don't wanna to ramble too much, so I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to think about the body and the ways that um, queer artists um, can use the body um, as a mean of making meaningful art outside of institutions. Um, I spoke about um, queerness as resistance, but also I, do, I don't want to conceive of queerness as something purely deconstructive or that comes purely from a position of opposition or negativity or rejection, um, but rather can also be something imaginative. Um, Elizabeth Friedman um, views queerness as something physical and that involves bodies engaging with other bodies. In her book, Queer Temporality, she posits the concept of erotohistography, historiography, um, which she defines as the conscious use of the body as a channel for and a means of understanding the past. Um, she talks about SM and other sort of queer physical practices that offer the possibility of turning traumatic experiences um, from a personal or collective past into something positive. Um, and the use of um, uh, sort of the use of um, things such as pain um, that may lead to forms of temporal or, uh, or historical consciousness. So I guess thinking about um, artists such as Catherine Opie or Ron Athey, who use practices such as, you know, um, body modification, scarification, s &M, like I mentioned, to alleviate previously inflicted bodily harm and psychological harm, and also connect to other queer communities past and present um, through these kind of rituals or practices on their body. 
Um, I also think it's very interesting, this idea of kind of transcending through queerness and the body, transcending and rejecting chronology and embracing anachronism. Um, I think that's one of the exciting things about being queer is that the past and the present and the future uh, are constantly informing and becoming absorbed within one another. And these artists specifically through connecting to the past um, and connecting to experiences, not just on a personal, but also a collective level of um, collective trauma. Um, it's possible to explore and negotiate this idea of a shared, a shared experience within the queer community and is able to track its history, progress and possibilities for liberation. Um, I guess the last thing that I sort of mentioned was, you know, outside of institutions, this idea of, you know, the street. Um, I think that is also particularly interesting to think about in terms of queerness, because I think the public is the queer private and uh, interventions in public space offer a lot of radical possibility for um, queer artists and for black queer artist, artistic production. Um, the, uh, and I think especially going back to um, the sort of work I did on situationism and I guess what the situationists would call the society of the spectacle that we live in, this highly overly commodified world. Um, I think uh, a lot of queer artists that make public work in, in order to not only democratize, but to sort of critique the cultural, economic and political conditions that we live in. Um, so yeah, the street offers sort of a great place um, for artistic experimentation and practice. Um, I think uh, stuff like guerrilla projection, hijacking, determinant are, um, how strategies artists can use outside of the institution um, to, to, to critique the institution and to also and critique the, the conditions in which we live um, and make art that is um, able to be shared um, wildly, widely um, with people outside of you know, the, the formal gallery or museum space. Thank you so much, Christine. I always learn so much um, when I listen to you speak. Um, and a lot of what you said actually feeds in well to our final speaker, who is Lola Olivin. Go ahead. Hey, everyone. I first want to say it's been so wonderful to hear everyone speak. Um, I'm going to be brief because I want to get to the kind of discussions um, and questions. Um, and, but I think my reflections um, kind of tie up what everybody else has said in, in quite a nice way, I think. Um, so I, like others, approached this panel, um, the title at least, with some reluctance. Um, I think I'm at, at an age where my relationship to institutions is purely one of suspicion. Um, I've seen the way that they can chew and spit people out, um, how they subsume and parrot the language that we use to name our oppression. I've seen how they drain energy from those organizing within them, how they work through bureaucracy, committees, complaints, procedures, hierarchies to numb, uh, to numb us to the exploitation that keeps them going and to obscure the violence that is trapped within them. Epistemic, actual violence with regards to uh, sexualized, racialized, homophobic um, violence, neo-colonial violence, how the institution silently ensures violence abroad that we can't see, how it funds it, how it trains researchers to justify it, and so on. But thinking about my own experience and, uh, experiences and political consciousness, I am, um, unfortunately, like other people here, kind of indebted to the institutions, the university at least. Um, the institution or the university was where I honed the language to name my own exploitation at the hands of oppressive governing forces. It is where I studied um, the strategies to get free and where I came into relation with others in ways that seriously changed the course of my life. As Moten and Hani suggest, universities rely on a kind of cyclical relationship between debt and credit. And to stretch these words, not only is the student constantly in financial debt, debt so abstract that now we're, we're taught to think of it as a kind of tax, they're also indebted to the modes of study that the university facilitates. 
when the university is the space where we encounter and begin to engage with um, a cer certain kinds of theoretical openings, the space for a critical relationship to it begins to close, I think. The student, the radical PhD um, scholar, the early career academic owes much to the university, a site of personal flourishing and collective failure. They owe much to the mechanisms that make them a student, that give them ten uh, tenure, that publish their work and um, sell their ideas. All this to say, what's the use of the institution? I think when we talk about use, we're almost always talking about purpose purpose is what makes a thing useful. So if at the very least, the purpose of the university is not strife, not uh, making our contempt for management known, pulling apart the university, sharing its resources, opening it up and out through demand making, picket lines and protests, how can it be useful? The university is not a meaningful site for political work as we've heard before, but I think it can be a site of study and studying the plan of university grounds, treating our time in it as a kind of reconnaissance mission, ensuring that it doesn't flatten or steal our desire for more livable, uh, livable worlds, for a planet of abundance, for an end to premature death, our recognition that this cannot be all there is. I'm making the case for a commitment to study um, that evokes in us a naive wonder in relation to the world around us. One that recognizes our pain, one that asks us to be involved in the journey of coming to know that which we did not know before. I think queer methodologies are our best hope of doing this. So what are the queer methods that might help us deal with um, the institutions in front of us? Sabotage. I think sabotage seems ineffective as it's not necessary, it doesn't necessarily prescribe an end to the thing under attack. Maybe the university remains standing, maybe it disintegrates, but by sabotage, I mean to attack the very thing that keeps the neoliberal university ticking, exclusivity. Exclusivity of thought, of location, of knowledge, short of a mass dropout, Sabotage is the best, um, is the next best not good enough strategy. The not good enough strategy is something and something is better than acquiescence, I think. So in the queer spirit of failure, we can admit defeat, but not stop doing the work, even if it means we have to expend useless energy for useless goals within our useless institutions. I think to render the university useless is to finally give it a purpose. I think queer methods um, also allow us to play with temporality in ways that at least unsettle the foundations of the university's prized possession, knowledge production. In the research that I've, um, I do, I've, uh, I've orientated myself against chronology and history with a capital H. I think chronology in my assessment refers to an understanding of events and processes preceding one another to form a linear narrative of progress. Put simply, uh, chronology, uh, chronology sorry, places events and objects in an order and in doing so gives each thing a role and a purpose in the construction of a timeline of ontology. That order inscribes meaning. It gives substance to being. From that order, hegemonic clock time emerges. I understand hegemonic clock time as an order of continuity following the Savransky and others in which the present prolongs itself through a temporal regime which advocates that nothing outside of the order dictated by the clock and the Gregorian calendar exists. So right now it's 4.52. I understand a change to have occurred when I look at the clock and it's 4.54. Against this, I think to understand the past and the present and the future as contemporaneous, to attune, uh, to attune ourselves through prefiguration to the future now, what the endless windows of the present might offer, what we cannot anticipate, is to take seriously that the stuff of history is more often than not born from a contest over power, which intends to bolster colonial modernity in suppressing our imaginative capacities. To embrace queer scavenger methodologies, non-linear, fragmentary traces, echoes, whispers, is to refuse um, the totality of narrative and is to understand how temporal distortion can at least help us make a dent in the institution's ideological force. This seems to me the starting point for major concepts which we can maybe go on to talk about abolition, emancipation, freedom, revolution. I think messing with order is perhaps what queers do best. Um, so maybe we can start there. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Lola, and thank you so much, all of you, um, for kicking this off just so brilliantly. Um, I'm definitely interested in hearing questions from the audience, but I can kick us off with something. I think at the end that inevitably popped up in all the things that you shared, uh, which I guess is the idea of sort of transience. So sort of Siang talking about the transience of students uh, appearing at Cambridge and organizing. I remember when I was a student, we'd always complain about that, how that's a major issue that students are only here for three years and then all their knowledge goes with them and we start the same fights all over again and how do we create institutional memory? Um, but listening to you, it seemed like there was Good, there was still good to be drawn from the very fact of that transience. And it made me think about what um, Christine was saying about the value of the internet, um, its speed, its fluid temporality. Um, what Abira was saying, or well, Abira's projects within dealing sort of affective pedagogies, things that like, or affective pedagogic strategies, things that sort of can't be touched and can't be placed in any one specific time. Um, so, I think it would be interesting to draw more of that out of you. Um, and I'd like to start with Lola, um, just because something we were talking about yesterday very briefly was the idea of sort of the archive, um, thinking about how Sarah Ahmed writes in, what's the use, the sort of the faintness uh, of, of like the record of, of queers, of queer people in the archive, uh, queer people, having to sort of acquaint themselves with, with the faint and the flickering. So how, yeah, how do we engage with institutions or how do we, sometimes we're forced to try and remember ourselves, learn about ourselves through the use of institutions that like seek to erase and um, forget us. Um, how do we think outside of time? How do we think outside? How do we think within transient modes of being, affective modes of being? Um, as we do that, and more broadly, in like the quest to abolish institutions. Not a small question then, um, a big one. Um, I think, first of all, your question makes me think about how in the work that I'm doing, I'm really trying to resist this idea that our job as people who care, as people who resist within specific institutions or sites or terrains is to fill in the gaps of, of the history that is prescribed to us, right? Like the institution exists um, in that kind of cyclical way in order to, to forget us. And the archive is always already an exercise in erasure. And so in, in the research that I'm doing, I'm less interested in bolstering grand narratives of history by filling in gaps and more thinking about, as you've, um, as you've said, how we can um, work with incompleteness and how we can work with not knowing, right? What would, what would it mean to understand history, um, not as a series of successive moments, but as um, this, as kind of Glissant writes, as a, um, uh, as a mechanism of like trace thought? How might we be able to kind of trace connections between moments that seem to exist in the past, in the present, or um, resist this idea that we have to provide a total picture of what the past is, or that that total picture of the past somehow tells us who we are now, right? I'm very interested in, in this idea of you know, not knowing, not being able to understand your con your present conditions without understanding the context from which you emerge, your, your past, as it were, um, you know, which I think has some substance. But when you live in a regime that's um, designed its institutions, its ways of being, its processes um, designed constantly to um, abstract and alienate you from that history, abstract and alienate you from that contest over power, right, that defines what history is, um, then I think you find much more kind of power, freedom, space for play um, in understanding that you'll never, uh, you can never find the total story. There's, there's no um, amount of excavation that you could do that could bring you closer to understanding a history um, that has been withheld from you by power, right? So, in, in the present, your your task or your thinking has to be aligned with, you know, how do I transform material conditions in the present, but also how does the work that I'm um, 
uh, doing in the present put me in relation to not only the past but also to the future right if we understand these things as constantly existing together how can I feel the past now how can I feel the future now right and how do, how do I stop this anticipatory mode towards the future or um yeah how do I stop awaiting something to happen and recognize actually my agency in in the um the moment that I'm I'm based in so yeah that those are my kind of thoughts around kind of temporality and I guess practically just at the end that means um not getting on the hamster wheel that the the university wants you to get on in terms of like constantly you know through monuments through memorial through you know committees on xyz how do we remember x how do we remember y that's not the central question i think and once you reframe that um then i think you the the terrain of your political demands within any given institution expands you know um, um beyond what you could possibly imagine i think Okay, cool. I love that idea. Um, Abira, how do you think this sort of like fits in within the methodology of hope? I saw you writing and nodding a lot. Um, I was taking notes as usual when Lola speaks because that is what one does. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I relate to Lola's kind of sentiment about playing with temp temporality and not letting it control us. And I think that's something that I really reckon with as someone who is within the university, you know, and trying to trying to practice not to be kind of like what Siang said about like decentering the university as the site of its abolition. But what do we do in the meantime? Like that's kind of what I am occupied with. And like something that's been so like the piece that I wrote is in a way kind of thinking about the temp temporality of the classroom in terms of okay, so the classroom that studies the subjects of race, gender, empire, et cetera, is in many ways obsessed with kind of how the past lingers in the present, right? This idea of haunting. Um, but what I'm genuinely really afraid of is how um, in the present that can impart kind of a immobility on students, like a political immobility on students, um, especially, you know, students who are very much attuned to how their lives are structured by those very violences that we're studying, right? So what kind of future vision can you as an educator in this violent institution help the students imagine? And I think that is kind of um, a political project, but you know, that you can take on within the university without being without being um, tied to the existence of the university. So, you know, like Lola mentioned, um, Moten and Harney's kind of conceptualization of study. And I think I really like what Moten and Harney, um, how they conceptualize study as this like speculative practice. And I think um, speculative practice can be a way for students and the educator to think about how to speculate about better futures, you know, how to deal with the hauntings in a way um, that is collective and that involves kind of sociality and involves, um, yeah, you like daring to think uh, with the utopic in mind. I feel like that's a great line. I'm gonna write that down as um, Siang jumps in with any thoughts that they might have. Cool, yeah. Um... I think just um, something, things like you were saying kind of made me think about um, the ways that universities have latched onto decolonization as this thing that they are obsessed with. And decolonization meetings are actually, university meetings are actually some of the most, I don't enjoy them because it feels like everyone is really invested in something that I know is simply not useful. <laughs> For us, in the sense that I think, especially one of the one of the ways that uh, universities have really latched onto decolonization as something to talk about to make them look good and feel good, is its kind of timeline or the chronology that they assign to it. In the sense that you know we're going to be excavating the colonial history or the past and you know the legacies of these things that you know we did. But what those things don't address is the fact that while you are again, investigating your monuments and, you know, things which should be returned. Um, you're also ignoring what the university is not talking about in the present, what it is doing, what its role is in maintaining, maintaining, you know, 
imperialism, <laughs> what its role is financially in the current economy, what its role is in maintaining inequality in the present, all kinds of inequality, global inequality, those kinds of things. So it, it loves to frame, you know, it frames the harm as being in the past. And what we're living with is the legacy of something which has happened, but we're not doing it anymore. We're not doing it anymore. So everything that we, all those, all our attentions and energies should be directed to kind of, you know, thinking of the past. How do we talk about the past? How do we uncover what we did then? But not thinking about what, to, what are we still doing in the present? Things which are, you know, still pretty terrible. Um, and um, things which stay in the university and which the university itself sustains. And in terms of the thing about talking about students as being quite transient, I guess for me, like, um, I, I think organization is distinct from institutions. And I think that what, what students especially require is <laughs> organization and something that actually, you know, the, the students union, depending on who works there and what they're there for, <laughs> um, can, can assist with in part. Um, but I also think that there, I think as you kind of maybe alluded to as well, like there is a way that the past, the past and kind of the past um, can have a hold on what you're doing in the present that means that you don't necessarily engage with the current conditions and the future possibilities and actually I think like within within student rooms for example I think because in part there's been not kind of a vague memory of things that have happened but not a lot of actual memory in, in terms of like passing down like people's experiences what worked what didn't work what happened what didn't happen in the kind of like nitty gritty details that there is a kind of hold that the past and what we've been doing has over what we currently are doing, but not necessarily the ability to critically evaluate why we did those things and how they worked and how they didn't work and how might we do them differently now and how might we choose different tactics in the present when the situation is different from what it was before. Um, so, yeah, um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, that was really interesting. It makes me think about how so many of those conversations seem to demand so much from the archive in the sense that it would basically be a list of failures that we never had to make again. Um, I think that's what people wanted and that's that's not possible. <laughs> um, Christine, did you want to jump in? Um, I don't have that much to add, but I guess just sort of tacking on to something Siang said about um, I guess universities becoming obsessed with this idea of decolonization. Um, I just, I guess, I want to just like um, say that it, it's something. It's the same with you know museums and sort of art institutions that they begot, become bogged down with this sort of idea of, um, but bogged down with the ideas of like repatriation of decolonization and thinking that kind of is enough to. Um, kind of like quell um, all the sort of call outs they get for the stuff and I think the this idea that the museum can be decolonized is just not something that I believe is possible and I think that you know museums try to try as hard as they can not to interrogate their role in knowledge production and how their collections and exhibitions sort of contribute um, to, to overarching, you know, narratives and and types of oppression and marginalization, and I think um, it's not just about what is displayed, um, but, it, but also how how it's displayed and how we see things and how sort of knowledge is produced by viewing, um, and those are things that museums have to reckon with, and I don't think that it's sort of possible to do them within the existing kind of structures that we have for them um yeah well that's really useful and i think you've sort of answered one of the the, the first question that we got in from yeah's line um where they've just mentioned it's been around a year since organizations institutions wrote their quote-unquote anti-racism pledges posted black squares on social media etc um and and that's kind of the extent that's as far as it went um, how can we hold the directors of these organizations and museums to account for these actions? I guess the whole point is that 
they can say the right thing, um, but they're fundamentally unreformable. Uh, and this is perhaps the most that we can expect of them. Um, so moving on to the next question that we got from Sarah. Um, Sarah would be very interested to know your thoughts about the role of the classroom, the library and the archive in relation to histories of radical thought. Are these political resources that can be sustaining and powerful tools for resistance, as well as mechanisms of reproducing hegemonic norms and hierarchies? Um, I don't know who wants to go first there, but the floor is open. I can go. Um, I, I mean, I can speak to the role of the classroom just because um, the piece that I kind of, that I read kind of an excerpt of kind of deals with kind of the, how, how to think about like how the classroom can be a site of exactly that reproducing radical thought, but also kind of reproducing norms. And an example I use um, is teaching Fanon basically, and kind of the possibilities of teaching Fanon, but also how that's kind of a site of tension as well, and how to deal with that tension productive, productively. So like an example I give is basically like starting a lecture that I gave with Fanon about homonationalism to think about kind of, you know, how uh, the gendered body is always a racialized body, et cetera, et cetera. And then ending with kind of, you know, after the discussion about like how homophobia is like utilized, et cetera, et cetera kind of confronting Fanon's homophobia for the students in the classroom as well. And I think that um, that's really important. I think it, uh, like um, confronting Fanon's homophobia in the classroom um, for me was an opportunity to practice the reparative stance that I'm calling for and practice the utopic stance. So rather than teaching for students the kind of like a search for Fanon or this like ped pedestalization of Fanon as this like perfect figure of radical thought actually kind of arguing, okay, so what options do we have when we accept that, you know, footnote 44 of Black Skin White Mass talks about how like the Martinican homosexual doesn't exist, right? So like, what can we do from that for our political project? And like, you know, th there are three options that a student could go with. They could go with, you know, okay, well, we're imposing kind of out of date logics on like out of date politics on gender onto Fanon and that's unfair. Or we can just say, okay, well, all male anti-colonial thinkers are, go are bound to be homophobic and misogynistic, misogynistic. So let's leave them aside, which is kind of the paranoid stance. Or we can, you know, imbue Fanon with possibility and say, okay, so Fanon hold, hold, held these views, but I can still take utility from Fanon for my own political project because, you know, Fanon's homophobia is the reality of the world that we live in, but that doesn't preclude kind of um, drawing on utopic thinking and building on utopic thinking with Fanon. And I, I kind of say that, you know, this confronting Fanon opens up for the students then like, diasporic queer thought and black queer studies that productively deal with these questions and deal with kind of imagining both anti-colonial thought as queer, you know, queer futurities. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess that was my attempt at answering that question. <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant. I've always been intrigued by how you, um, how you deal with that. I have to, yeah, look more into that. Um, did anybody else? want to add something or should we jump on to the next question? So yeah, is that a hand up? Yeah, just like, uh, just briefly. Um, I think kind of like, actually just think about, I guess, decentering university. I think that, uh, yes, as, as a bit just outlined, it definitely can be. <laughs> um, I think also that there are a lot of like very strange discussions going on um, in like, just, online um, among students about, you know, how can you expect like students to be able to read like university texts and things. And there is an issue obviously with like how accessible a lot of things are, but there is also like this, this radical thought, this radical history, this like radical teaching, this radical thinking is not the sole preserve of the university. And it's actually, it's, throughout like you know history of like radical movements and these kinds of things like those readings those systems of thought have been taught and kept alive by people who did not 
have access to higher education who probably, you know, like were taught to think in more useful ways <laughs> because they were outside higher education, um, who engaged with text in more productive, productive, well, productive, um, in in ways in ways that are different from how we are often encouraged to engage with text in higher education. Um, and I don't know, um, I just want to say that. <laughs> Can I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to jump off what Siang um, was saying, because it just briefly, it makes me think about, and this is probably the same for you, like Siang, Christine, um, where there are like, um, and, and Abira as well, like, it, it was for me the spaces where we did reading groups, reading these radical texts where there wasn't a teacher present that were the most kind of transformative. So it's when we like took agency over the material and said, let's make our own reading group or let's like do this like campaign based on what we've read or let's organize in the way that they seem to have organized in 19 whatever. Um, that, that for me, you know, answers that question also. It's like detaching the history of that, like you said, Siang, detaching the history of that radical thought from um, the teacher ne necessarily and from the classroom space. Um, that I, I feel like that's where you know students often find that they can make these intellectual leaps. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, and yeah, Siang, I vibe with like I, I feel like fairly frequently on Twitter that uh, these these sorts of conversations come back, and every time somebody's just like, "Oh, you shouldn't read Marx because he's he's too hard," I'm just like, "That's a CIA op. You should read Marx." Um, <laughs> so I guess for the next question, uh, we can combine a couple of the ones that came in, um, which, yeah, I guess somebody was sort of asking whether the university has ever existed as a space um, that wasn't oppressive to students. Um, and I think we can think about which students exactly there. Um, there was a question about how we imagine the sort of which I guess you've kind of gone into, how, how do we imagine like the sort of liberatory educations uh, that we managed to sort of steal from ourselves, for ourselves, uh, between lectures and whatever? How do we imagine that kind of education happening once the university is abolished? Um, and also, you know, to what, to what extent does joy play a role in the reimagining and the abolitioning, abolitioning? abolition of the institution? <laughs> Um, I don't know, Christine, did you want to jump in or did you want to have a think first? Um, I'm still absorbing the question. I'm reading it, it was very long. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> if anybody else has any immediate thoughts, they should go. <laughs> I think um, on uh, the question, I guess I can kind of try to speak to um, the idea of the imagination and also like the role and place of joy. And I think actually one of the great tricks of the, the university at least is to make us think that like knowledge only exists within those building, like within that building or within that kind of structure. And as like Siang has pointed out, has, as loads of people has, have pointed out, you know, knowledge not only exists, you know, in, in um, different forms, but it also exists in grassroots political, you know, organization making, in demand making, in um, manifesto making, in, in any kind of uh, space where people get together and begin to assess their own material conditions, whether that's bolstered by text or not. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that, like, if anything, it is the university that shackles us and stops us from a more liberatory, imaginative, educational terrain, right? Because if the um, if the university didn't exist, I'm at least thinking of education as you know accessible, if that if that's the word, or education as free, education as you know you leave your home and you're able, or you leave the place that you live and you're able to come into contact with others who ch who constantly change how you see yourself and how you like move through the world, and that for me is a is the best thing about education that that the possibility of relation and I feel like what what the institution does as well as capitalism racism governing oppressive forces is alienate us from one another and alienate us from the possibilities contained in our connections with one another not only effectively in terms of how we you know feel but also in terms of what we could learn um, and so maybe I don't know maybe people have this idea that without the 
without the institution, there would be no order or chaos or there would be no books or whatever. And I actually see it as a much more like democratized isn't even the right word. I see it in, in the spirit of kind of anarchy that, that Christine brought up in the spirit of mutual aid, in the spirit of giving to each other and taking from each other in ways that don't confer hierarchy or power. And to me, that is, that, that is such a joyous proposition, you know, like, work happens within the, the institution and work is so boring and so dull and so terrible and it robs us of so much and so the opposite of that can only mean more joy more togetherness more connection but not in a kind of facile way in a way that means that we might actually like see each other instead of you know um relating to each other in between work and then the meal and then childcare and then all of these things that stop us from you know being with, with each other in a meaningful way love that um i was gonna say like yeah thank you for those words lola that's exactly how i feel <laughs> um, um but i was also gonna say in like to kind of add on to this like idea of like uh the the possibilities and like the beauty of like relation and what we learn from each other outside of institutions um in um my year as like I guess what is now Cambridge SU, but was KUSU. Um, I was the welfare officer for the student union and I ran a project um, sort of alongside um, my work called Our Streets. And it was like a psychogeographical project that sort of aimed to visualize um, the sort of history of, um, I, it, was, it was technically about the history of, of women sort of like organizing and gathering but generally I guess it was sort of like a genealogy of like joy and emotion um, in Cambridge um, by sort of putting out a very long questionnaire that I asked like as many people in the town to fill out as possible and um, putting together this map that sort of visualized the places that meant most to people throughout the years um, in Cambridge. And we had people who lived in Cambridge in the forties submitting it as well as like students who were still like studying or had just matriculated, et cetera. And I guess the whole point was that it was to understand that like outside of the institution of the university, there are all these places and that have brought here that brought people together and all these places that have been instrumental to people's experiences of the town and of like uh, the university itself but that don't have anything to do with the university and like all these places that ha are, have such strong emotion whether that's like positive negative you know there were people sharing experiences of like joy and like desire happiness but also people sharing you know heartbreak um death like all this stuff that like informed their um education and growth outside of the university and i think you know those things are as important if not more important that than, than what you learn inside the walls of the classroom um yeah Yeah, I agree with that last point. Um, particularly, even like within my own experience, even though I'm like a lawyer now and I studied law, I still find that day to day I'm drawing more on what I learned um, in fly meetings um, through organizing with the students' union than I ever do from what I learned during my degree. Um, and joy was inherent in that, if only just that experience of first arriving and just deciding that it's the place isn't for you, but you're here for three years. And then I don't know, you see a quirky black woman walking down the street and you're like, that's going to be my friend. <laughs> and it's the beginning of something wonderful. Um, okay, so I'm conscious of time. So I think that we should start wrapping up. Um, I guess we could just go around with some final thoughts. I'm sorry for those who submitted questions um, that didn't get to be um, answered. Um, but yeah, if we just like do a little round robin wrapping up, we can go in the opposite order than we did at the start. So Lola, what are your final thoughts? I was just running my eyes actually over um, some of the questions to kind of inform, um, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. What I've, I've taken away from this is, is mostly what I take away from all conversations about kind of possibility 
that, that these things that we we talk about we don't just talk about in the abstract right like that we're all kind of here and we all believe in these possibilities but we, we're also all uh, willing to adopt a discipline that like a political discipline um, and political organizing that might help us you know achieve it or even like temporarily alleviate some of the suffering conditions um, that we experience in the university and so I guess I want to I want to um, end on this idea of a, a, like as Abira outlined like critical hoping this idea of like um, not thinking of, of hope as optimism, right? Like optimism is something facile. Like we can have a critical relationship to these institutions and still believe in, in the possibilities um, that lie beyond them and enacting those possibilities in these moments. I think so much about like the moment of the strike, so much about the moment of the protest or the reading group, whatever. We change our relations to each other in, in those moments, I think. And that that is that future project, right? And so that for me is what stops or helps me combat the alienation of or, or the, the discourses of ever downward decline, right? The university is in a terrible position. It will continue to be in a terrible position. It'll be in a terrible position five years from now. But, you know, orientating my politics in terms of other people and not so much, you know, the language and discourse of the institution is what keeps me um, yeah, believing in that possibility of, of relation, of touching one another. Thank you, Lola. Um, who, would you, who was just before you? It was Christine, yes. Uh, yeah, I was also just sort of scanning my eyes down the chat and I saw a question about whether I think the Black queer body in public space could be a tool for countering the colonization of Blackness and queerness and the subsequent shame and silence placed upon Black queer bodies. Um, so I guess I'll just answer that in my final point, um, which is like, as I said, I believe that the public is the queer private um, and there is, there's something radical in acting out queer desire, queer Black desire, um, and whatever else as a queer person in public. Um, I love the streets, I belong to the streets. Like I think um, there's something very powerful in being in public space. Um, uh, I did, like I said, I did my dissertation on the situationists and I wrote a lot about derive, which um, Debord talks about as, you know, walking the city as a way to understand it and to sort of absorb the, the distinct um, atmospheres of your kind of like physical environment. Um, and not just as a way of, I guess, understanding the city, but specifically as an act of transgression against the spectacle and whatever other forces um, sort of try to demarcate where and how you should exist in public space um, and of disrupting the sort of, um, yeah, di disrupting uh, the, the kind of routines that are sort of, in, the routines and stuff that's like enforced on you um, and the subversion of all of this by just, you know, existing in the public space. Um, but I also do want to kind of footnote it by saying that like the public also isn't everything and as somebody who is disabled I think it's like important to also like recognize um, what uh, what bodies can exist um, in public space and what that means for bodies that don't uh, have access to the public or don't or don't you know exist on the street um, in in that way um, so yeah Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Siang. Yeah, um, cool. Also just looking at some of the questions um, a bit. I think, so like my job is to, you know, look at, you know, access, education, participation. And I think the way that access is talked about and thought about in the mind of the university is very uh, hollow um, in the sense of, you know, we want to invite people who traditionally have been less represented here in order to have a Cambridge experience, have a Cambridge degree. And obviously it does confer personal privilege, personal privileges, and also give you access to certain resources, which, you know, is sometimes a good thing. Um, but what it also does is it doesn't change anything about itself. It will never change anything about itself. So it invites you to become a part of it. And in order to be a part of it, 
you have to change yourself to be part of you know this system and for um there is like this kind of idea that you know this is kind of a, a linear trajectory towards progress um and somehow through this we're gonna you know recoup the recoup the university recoup higher education into something that is for everyone um but i think you know when we say you know the, the institution isn't built for you for us for a lot of people who are here the institution isn't built for basically anyone <laughs> who is here it's it's built in order to you know perpetuate the class system to perpetuate uh inequality to perpetuate systems of oppression locally and globally and even like even as it you know introduces more and more people who you know traditionally wouldn't wouldn't be like would be less represented in the university at the same time it there's this yeah the kind of myth of like you know it it it's the way that people are going to get ahead and it's the way that you know it's going to it, it it the myth that it will do anything significant to change the class system in this country <laughs> when what it does it change is change itself to the circumstances in order to better serve the perpetuation of the class system for a a new and different age of neoliberal capitalism so for me i guess you know we just need to divest ourselves from the institution you're still here you see the situation around you, you see, you know, what you have, have access to, what you don't, and you use it for the purposes that, you know, you require, which are liberation, uh, revolution, uh, building power, and, you know, really don't, don't invest yourself in the institution itself. Um, and when I think about, you know, like, education as a source of liberation in actuality, I think of, you know, in many, uh, post-colonial revolutions, communist revolutions, and one of the first things that they did was mass literacy programs and teaching everybody to read Lenin. <laughs> and these are the things that they don't want you to read <laughs> in UK higher education because it's the, the things that they teach you to understand your place in the world and how you can actually not just, you know, feel empowered or feel represented, but actually be empowered and, you know, be able to uh, change, change society. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that, Siang. And finally, Abira. It's going to be really hard to follow up to, <laughs> to all those interventions, but I think I want to um, just pick up on where Siang left off um, in terms of you know the institution has never been has been is basically for no one, you know. Um, and I am just thinking about how all of these institutions, whether it's you know. Um, the institution, like the university as institution, or Christine, in Christine's case, the art institution, how it benefits from our criticality as a way of affirming its own existence. Um, so, you know, like Stefano Harney and Fred Moten say that the critical academic is the professional par excellence, you know, the critical academic's labor of critiquing the university in a way affirms their own existence as an academic within the university system. Um, and yeah, it's just something that I've been thinking about a lot in terms of where do where do the where do our allegiances of our critica criticality lie? Do they lie in you know kind of improving the institution or just making it more survivable until you know we achieve something otherwise? Um, uh, and yeah, that's I guess that's just where I want to end. Well, thank you all so much for a really, really brilliant evening. I'm sorry we overran by, by two minutes. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really have any words. Um, you can see from all the comments that um, people have found everything that you've said important, inspiring, generous, powerful, moving. So thank you for taking the time. Um, and thank you to all the participants for coming. It was really great to have you here. And I hope you all have wonderful evenings. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I just want to jump in quickly before you go and thank you very much for what you said um, and all the contributions you've made. Um, and obviously as someone working in an institution, I'm very sympathetic to all of the ways in which they block so many things um, and destroy so many things. I think though that we're living right now in the midst of quite a radical 
deinstitutionalization of so many things. Um, and it will be important to think about what opportunities that presents um, as they are deconstructed, which they are being now. Um, I wanna thank you in particular for everything you've added to making that something we can think about much more critically. Um, and I'd like to come back to the other spotlight, but I'm not sure how to do that. Um, just gonna go back to that. There we go. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> I thought I was jumping in, but I think I took over the whole screen. Whoops. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. It's so wonderful to see you here bringing a very critical queer perspective to the very question that you're asking in such a powerful way, um, which in itself is, of course, hugely inspiring. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you also to the audience for coming. Um, and we'll be resuming tomorrow. Um, at 4 p.m. So I hope to see you then. So should we say good night? Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>